Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week here at the Survivor Academy. I am your personal Survivor instructor, Robert Sesternino, and I am back here with another great student of the game here as a guest lecturer. She wanted to be here when she heard that this was kind of like the Hogwarts of Survivor, where we were going to talk about everything the future Survivor players need to know. Please welcome to the Survivor Academy, the great Mary Kwiatkowski, Frail Mary. Mary, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to teach some lessons to the class here. I think I have some just wealth of knowledge because as we all know, online Survivor games are exactly the same as real Survivor games. And so those tidbits can 100% be translated directly over. So we're going to yes. use some of that base as well. <laughs> Well, uh, that's very interesting that you uh, opened up there. I'd like to uh, talk about that uh, a little bit more with you here today. And Mary, uh, we are going to be uh, putting this episode into our main podcast feed uh, to let people have a sample of what goes on here at the Survivor Academy. And this was a great week to do it here at the start of May and here uh, with a great guest like yourself. Mary, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I've been really enjoying this season. I feel like this has been a pleasant spring survivor season. You know, we've had we've had some some rough survivor years recently and then and then it started mm -hmm. to creep back up here. So, I feel like we finally hit back into that stride of like fun, goofy things happening, good yeah. gameplay, entertaining characters, meaningful moments. So, we're really checking all my boxes. I find it interesting that you said it's a fun spring survivor season, uh, which sort of implies that the worst survivor seasons have been sort of the even numbered seasons. Uh, is that been your experience? I, I wouldn't say the worst ones have been the even number seasons. I think something about the spring feels more and maybe because it's like that, that school mentality of like finals end of the year it's it's very busy in the spring and so i like to kind of relax a little more and just have my my tv viewing be like the the fun content that i can really get into whereas sometimes if the the seasons can be like kind of grueling uh i don't know that doesn't fit well with my sprains like you start you start looking outside and going i could be i could be out there though mm -hmm. so whereas in the fall i'm happy with whatever content i'm gonna get because i, I want to be inside anyway yeah okay well, Mary, let's get into Survivor 42. And as you said, uh, it's been a fun season so far. We're starting to like look at the end game here that I think that the finale is less than three weeks away. Can you believe it? I can't because <laughs> it seems so like I know that the episodes are the same as normal, but something about the shortened season feels mm -hmm. It feels shorter when I'm watching it, too, yeah. just because it's every time they call out like it's day 18 or whatever that I'm like, oh, no, it hasn't been that long. But mm -hmm. I'm I'm sad to, to see the end of this season. I could do longer with this cast. OK, uh, well, we still have, you know, some exciting stuff here to come. You opened with talking about as somebody who's played online reality games. Uh, we have a couple of people who also uh, fit into that category here in this season, of course, uh, famously Tori, but also Chanel. I feel like it's come up a little bit. Do you feel like that the experience of playing online reality games, not that you have played in a Survivor season yet, but do you feel like that there is a lot to learn or do you feel like that in some ways it could be a negative? I think it's generally a negative. And this also comes from me not having played actual Survivor. But I think that the people who, especially if you do well on online versions of the same type of strategy games, you can get into your head about thinking, hey, it worked for me there. It's going to be the same. And there's a lot of different strategy that, that goes into place. You have to be a lot more willing to be like assertive with your strategy and your social connections on online survivor. If you're playing these games, you have to constantly be talking to everyone. And I don't think that that's like not what you should be doing on survivor. You should be making connections, but I think ideally the connections you're making on survivor are a little bit more grounded in like what's actually happening in the game, uh, you know, connecting on your outside life and not so much just like putting in the work to put in the work. And I think that sometimes we'll see people like, I think with Tori a little bit, it seemed like, she was coming in there just 
oh, okay, I need to make connections. Let me like run down this list of, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> elevator topics <laughs> to go through and kind of uh, make them that way. And so I think that you can kind of get stuck there by thinking like oh I'm, I'm following the the recipe that I've learned but I do think I do think playing any kind of strategy game is really good to help practice certain skills that you might need just might maybe in a different context like practicing lying practicing how you know when you when you backstab someone how to deal with them once they're upset at you and how to like deal with fallout like I think that those things are important as long as you're practicing those skills in the games but if they don't come up in your online game then but you still got to learn it somewhere. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I feel like it's definitely been talked about, but the skills that are necessary to win the online strategy games or, you know, even sort of like these one day strategy games that they're, the bonding and the social uh, like uh, like connections that you make with people are so much more important in the survivor game where I'm not sure that necessarily like the strategy is the most important thing where it's really like just like having like really good connections with everybody i think ends up being a more important thing in terms of like how people uh want to work with you on survivor yeah and i mean like my the way that i liked to play the online games was very much so of just sort of for fun trying to see what strategy i could throw out there and do like i i see a lot of uh inspiration in the way that omer's playing the game here because that's like the way that i would think about things like we we had parts where there was kind of like tonight a split tribal where there was one group going and one group going and i thought to myself wouldn't it be really cool if even if i could try and find a way to make what i want to happen in the other tribal that i'm not going to and so I just spent like all afternoon trying to to work on one particular person over there and, and you know, build seeds in their mind that maybe they should do something different. And when it worked, I was like, well, that was fun. I don't know if that was necessary, but it, you know, it can happen. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing that you I want to like see. just like to toy with here. people. Yeah. It's, well, it's like that. When else in your life are you going to get to practice these kind of fun things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, being a master manipulator is not something that's generally encouraged <laughs> among mm -hmm. your friends and family. So... Mm -hmm. You know, that's the time to go for it. Okay. Well, good to know. There's like a whole other side of you that uh, I didn't even know was out there. I knew well, you were is, like very cutthroat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's uh, why playing I these games. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have a, uh, a lot to uh, go through from uh, this week's episode. And of course, uh, the, the, the journey of, of high. Uh, is there any particular place you want to start, Mary? I think with, with high, I think, you know, the, the downfall really comes with losing Mike's uh, allegiance. And so the, the starting point for that, obviously, is the the flip against Roxroy. And the question is, really, was was that was there a way that high could have recovered from that? I mean, given everything that still happens in this episode with the reward and the conversation with Lindsay and Omer towards uh, towards Mike trying to move him away from high. Was there any way that High could have recovered from this and still gain kept Mike as an ally, or was after the, the you know like did he kind of lose that with the Roxroy vote? Yeah, I guess. Um, are we going back to including like should High have gone with the Roxroy vote? Well, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to do too much from last episode because you know in this world that already happened. It, you know, it mm -hmm. happened. He got him there, but I think you could have possibly tweaked some of the. You, know, you you have to think when you have your allies and there's someone who wants to do something different. You have to think how worth it is to push this direction because it's complicated with high. Like high might have been in a lose lose situation if high tells Omer, you know. I'm can't get can't get Mike on board. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do the Rock Troy vote. Maybe Omer's like, oh shoot, well, we gotta get high out if he can't even, you know, get Mike to work. Or maybe he thinks, oh, well, we gotta get Mike out because now Mike is immovable in the same way that Rock Troy was. Mm -hmm. So that you know, it's it's good to have that person you can kind of blame. Um, but unfortunately it 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 high didn't walk away from the previous episode uh keeping the relationship that he thought he had there and he also seemed to not you know omer approached high saying let's get rid of roxroy and then somehow that became to into mike's ears high's plan and it's like mm -hmm. you kind of you want to take credit for it but 
Hi really should have known at that moment, if he's trying to get Mike to do something he doesn't want to do, you need to blame that on Omer. You know, you can't like you can't convince him that it's your idea because then Mike is going to put all that onus on you. So mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important in Survivor. And this is what Omer is doing so well to hide the fact that you, you always want to be able to blame someone else for the move. Like you never want to seem like you're the one running everything. Um, and then just make sure that you keep enough knowledge of what you what you're actually doing so that you can convince people at the end that it was actually you. Yeah, I think the difference between High and Omer this season is that I think that High has uh, come into the game with sort of like the idea of like, okay, I need to not just get to the end, but need to get to the end with a resume. And I want to be playing from out in front and be seen as like the leader of the tribe and sort of like the leader of uh, Vati coming into the merge where Omer has been much more, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing because uh, if I, I bet, I'll get picked off if people end up thinking that I'm going to be the person. And it's been a very interesting way to be playing in the in the forties where I, I do think that that is how you want to play. I think Omer has been a great example of what you want to be doing uh, for high. I think he's very much wanted to be seen as the person who is sort of like that power player who is like the, the shot caller and didn't have any shields out in front of him. He talked about Jonathan as a shield for him at the early part of the merge. But I think that he is uh, at the point where he's voting him out. I don't think he felt like he needed that shield anymore. Right. And the other thing about the high and Mike relationship is that it's really important when you have a close ally like that to make the close ally feel like all of the moves you're making are mutually beneficial and that you're working together on the plan. If you come up with a plan and say, I want to get whoever, Jonathan out, then you need to approach Mike and say, hey, Mike, like, here are some, you know, you, you want to come up with the reasons why it's great for both of you and say like, hey, you, you want to do this plan? You and me, you and me make this plan together. It, it'll be our thing that we're doing. You never want to try. And, and I, I kind of did that toward the end. He was like, I want to make sure you're comfortable. I want to make sure I'm not steamrolling. I want to make sure that you don't you know, feel like I'm whatever. But it was kind of too late at that point. You need to develop the whole relationship as this like dynamic duo. And that's the way that you feel together. Like we're, we're this duo who's making these plans together and never have the other person feel like that. So that when... Omer tells Mike, like, oh, hi, sees you as a puppet. You need Omer to be like, ha, he's just trying to get to me because clearly that's not the case because of the time, all of the times when I've been the one to help, you know, make it, make it feel like I'm mm -hmm. the one who's coming up with the plan. Yeah. Well, how do we do this, Mary, if, if you're high and how, how do you ask your ally about what plan they want to do and not get stuck in the, uh, I, I don't know what do what do you want to do and you're just ending up like in a circle where it feels like that nobody is making a call and that's frustrating too. I think part of the key is talk at length through all of the plans, through all the plans out there and have both of you give all the pros and cons and all of the thoughts on all the plans. And even though you might have one or two that are really the ones that you want to start pushing for, first lay out more than that and and really get their feedback on which ones they are interested in as well and then sort of start narrowing down your plans to which ones they also seem some some interest in and start kind of trying to steer in one direction or the other sometimes you can even uh now this is complicated maybe you'll say too cute but pick the plan that's actually not your favorite plan and start moving toward that one and then somehow plant some seeds to where the one that is your favorite plan is like the backup and then hope that they want to flip to the backup at some point because people like to change the plans on survivor and, and you know once you feel like okay, we've got everything locked in, you start thinking, wait a second, now that we've got it, should I, maybe maybe we need to have the secondary one. So I always like the idea of first, never put yourself in a corner where there's only one outcome that you're comfortable with. Make sure that there's multiple outcomes you're comfortable with, and then try and pitch those ones to your ally. Hopefully that they'll pick one of the ones you're comfortable with and then try to sort of move them over to you. Yeah. It's interesting the way that Omer ended up uh, arriving at his plan. He listened to what Mike was having to say in complaining about high or wanted to make sure that he wanted to make sure that Omer was co comfortable with the way that things went down. And that's where Omer ultimately got that. It seemed like that that high actually got this plan when he was talking with Lindsay that he picked up on that Lindsay was uncomfortable with how Jonathan operated during the last uh, travel council. And then he was ready to run with the plan. He had uh, this confessional where he talks about how Lindsay had spoken to him. 
And she seems to be signaling to me that she wants Jonathan out next. And guess what, Lindsay? I'm open. I'm open. I'm open. So it's interesting that, you know, High sort of like picked up on the same sort of idea that Omer did where, you know, one of Jonathan's allies was complaining about him. In some ways, he kind of did the same thing that Omer was doing and was like, okay, oh, that, that, that's a shame that Jonathan is not listening to you. Like, we should go ahead and get Jonathan out. Uh, it just so happened that um, the, the, the plan uh, against High ended up being a lot more effective with Mike. Yeah, and it's a shame because in last episode we saw like Hi saying, you know, I don't want to make this move without Mike's okay. It's very important to me. Mike's my close ally, blah, blah, blah. I think part of it is that he might have just gotten a little bit complacent with the fact that if you feel like someone is your close ally, you might start thinking, well, of course they feel like like they know that because, you know, I, I like them so much and I trust them so much that of course they feel the same way to me. And I think that you need to always be thinking that the other person may not be reciprocating those feelings exactly. And so I, I, a lot of it, I think, stems from the the pre-merge, actually, where Hi and Lydia were such a pair and then it seemed like they sort of, I don't know, like saved Mike, pulled Mike in. And it never really felt like from our perspective that Hi like was really, really convincing Mike, like you are my number one, like I feel really, really close with you. And so I think that like Mike was very open and ready to turn on high because you know when when he hears omer say he want you know he he's saying that you're a puppet to him there's clearly something about the relationship that felt like that was already happening and even yeah. though he never said it that was there so it just it didn't feel like their their um alliance was on an equal playing field even though i think mike or a high really valued mike as an ally it, it, he wasn't able to see that that wasn't 100 percent reciprocated there yeah i wonder if they had also drifted apart to some degree where they had been sort of close with like daniel and chanel around but once mm -hmm. daniel and chanel were gone we saw mike spending more time with jonathan with rocks i love rocks uh, we heard about in the exit interview, Hi talked about how he was really his closest with Drea and with Omer. And I wonder if maybe there had been more tension under the surface with Mike and Hi for a while also. Yeah. And it, it's something like when you when you feel good about an ally, you can kind of take them for granted and say, OK, well, now we're at the merge. I'm going to move around and try to make some other connections. And you really got to if you want Mike to be your you know number one or someone that you're really, really sure of at all times, you got to keep checking back in and got to keep making making him feel like he's valid, uh, valued in the way that you feel he is. OK, um, we have a bunch of different questions. Uh, this is one from. Tommy Guam who wants to know about was it a smart move for Lindsay to share the amulet info? When is the correct time to share the advantage information? This is something that kind of uh, did not get talked about a lot so far in the podcast that I've done where Lindsay says, okay, oh, by the way, while we're sharing secrets, also I have an amulet, which is me and hi, Andrea, we all have a power. And she explained how the whole thing worked. It's interesting that, this was not only her secret to share. Um, she ends up giving away this big secret to two other people. Yeah, she gives it away. And she's also giving away Drea's secret, which mm -hmm. I think is the, the trickiest part here. Because normally my stance on the when should you share things about idols and advantages is if you have a clear plan for how sharing that information is going to directly help you in this next scenario. So like it kind of helped in the, Hey, it might be worth it to get high out because I've got this advantage that gets more powerful with highs gone. But how is that helping you use that advantage then that's now more powerful in the eyes of Mike and Omer or oh, Mike and Omer yeah. going to say, Oh, perfect. We need that really. Like, like you saw in David versus Goliath is a perfect example of when sharing information about the advantages that that group had of David's like works really well because they need help. They're down in the numbers and they they need all the information they can get to come up with these complicated vote splits. That's great for them to, to share that information. It's not great when Lindsay's in a position of relative power. She's uh, won a challenge, got some goodwill. She doesn't, like she wasn't taken on this and is trying to convince these people who took her uh, on the advantage or on the reward. Like, hey, work with me. Like she's she's already taken you. That should be enough to try and say like, hey, I brought you guys here because I want to work with you, et cetera. You don't need to then throw an extra thing <laughs> into the pile. Uh, right. 
So, yeah, I don't know what the intention was there, because even if you're trying to say like, oh, and let me tell you another thing about High, that he has been not telling you both about how he has this advantage. Like, well, aren't you doing the same thing? Uh, I mean, you lied to us for, you know, uh, 19 yeah. days about that. You didn't have uh, any advantages, uh, especially for Omer, who had been close with Lindsay the whole game. This was a big reveal. And on an episode that I thought was very good for Lindsay all around, I thought this was uh, the one big mistake that she made. Yes. So this is what I'm going to call is part of this is the downside to the sleepover party strategy, which uh, I think is is a very important strategy, both in real life and um, in Survivor. Yes, yes. So this is the the like we're all in this separate area. Where, you know, in this case, it's on a reward trip. It could be in other scenarios where not everyone's around. We've got sort of like the in crowd here. And we're going to start telling each other secrets in order to gain closeness. And Omer plays this perfectly. First off, he makes up a secret, which is even better than revealing something that's actually true. He makes up a secret in order to get Mike on his side and pull him away from high and with the direct intent of this could work well to also potentially get high out, which then closes the secret, right? Like there's not really going to be any more issue there. So that's like, he has a full plan and it's the perfect scenario of having these people together and say like, Oh, we're all together. And while we're here, you know what? We're feeling good. We've got pizza. We got beer. We saw our loved ones. And now I'm going to let you in on my little, you know, club. And that works really well because there's only almost no downsides for Omer here. The only downside would have been if Mike had immediately gone back and called high out on it. Um, but even then it was like such a stretch from the real true scenario that it probably, probably still would have worked out. Okay. Um, so that, now that's great. And I say you can do this in real life because like, I think this is like, you know, when you've got the, that group of friends where you're like, we're kind of close, but you know, I feel like we're, we're still like a little bit just like, maybe, maybe we only hang out at volleyball and we need to like, you know, get a little closer. If you have like a sleepover or you've got like a, an extended period of time separate from whatever that place, you know, work or wherever it is. Yes. And then that's when you really get close. And that's when you, you know, when you've, you've gone through this thing together and shared your secrets and stayed okay. up all night. Mary, it sounds like you're saying that you have a go-to fake secret that you <laughs> share in group settings, workplace retreats. <laughs> um, I don't know that I have one specific fake secret, but I definitely think it's important to reserve parts of your personality to only like provide to those when you're in specific scenarios. If you if you go to, you know, if you go to work day one and everyone's getting to know each other and you tell them everything, then that's not that's not a way to, you know, you got to give give leave something to be desired and only tell it to the to the certain group of people when you feel very comfortable. And you know, that can change. Like the the more you get to know someone, you'll say, "Hey, you know what? Now I feel like I can let you in on the sleepover party secret. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think this is a very important strategy yeah, for this life. This is very good. This is very yeah. good stuff. Great. This is this is how you make the distinction between acquaintances and friends and best friends. So it's very it's very. How many great. secrets do you know? Oh oh yeah, I can't I can't provide the secrets I, I, that I no, know. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you to re uh, reveal anybody's secret, Mary. I'm asking you. <laughs> that that's that's the metric of okay. I know three secrets from this person, but I know eight secrets for this person. So this is my best friend. Yeah. I mean, I think that that like that helps, right? Like, uh, you know, that's like one Oh one of like, have, have people feel like they're relying on you for, for keeping trust and confidence. Like, I yes. think that's very important. You know, so you good. certainly don't want to tell your secrets to the people who you don't trust. And if you do, that's why you need extra fake secrets, right? So that you can, you can be like, all right, I, you, you want me to share something, but I don't trust you. So it's going to be just the fake secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I need yeah. to work on all my fake secrets. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, this is not like, this is not a nefarious thing, right? This is like, I think a real important thing. I've told my friends this, like when, when you're, when you're finally starting to get close, you're like, oh my gosh, this is great. Look at us. We're having the sleepover party. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. And yes. it doesn't have to literally be a sleepover party. But like, let's say you've got like a, a family member, you know, like, oh, I just, I, I have issues with my, you know, my father-in-law. It's not, it's not perfect. I need to whatever, then just maybe, maybe make sure that you've got some time to, to go, go do a thing together, go on a, go on an extended walk together, help them with the household project. And that's when you can start sharing your secrets and feel close.
mm-hmm. or just like have an event happen that like the two of you you know are in on but no one else is this is very this is very good stuff i'm giving you here take yeah. notes class <laughs> this is very good this is this is very good um so what you, what you are giving is very good i think Lindsay giving away the secret uh no. was not was not Great. good i i we are uh, you're getting into like the reasons why she's doing it but she should have given away a fake secret and not the not the real one yeah and this because... is why omer did it correctly with this with the sleepover party and Lindsay didn't yeah yeah I mean, because then, you know, if somebody wanted to weaponize this against Drea or against uh, Lindsay and you can go to Drea and say, oh, by the way, I heard about the amulet. Drea told uh, Mm -hmm. Lindsay told us at the sleepover party. uh, It's like what she did. What? So I think that that was really a bad call on her part. I think that the better move would have been like to go home from the sleepover party and then tell uh, Drea at her sleepover. Hey, guess what? Want to know a secret? Uh, We're voting out high. Uh, And our our thing is going to be more powerful. That would have been great. Yeah, I think we're bringing up two things that I really like. One is covering all your bases. So you just constantly need to be keeping track of who you're telling what and then making the people who like Drea in this scenario that this affects. Ideally, you sort of hint to Drea that this might happen beforehand or you need to come up with a very good reason for why you felt like, you know, as Lindsay, why you felt like you needed to share this information to the people at the at the reward. Um and then the second part of this that I like is the just always make your allies feel like you're doing something together. Like this is the 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 plan like hey yeah hey Drea we got to let you know we got to vote vote high out for this reason and um you know it, like you can't straight up say like don't tell don't tell Mike and Omar that about the uh you know amulet cuz I already have like you don't want to do that but you need to you need to make Drea feel like it might be okay if other people find out this information. Mm-hmm. Even though it should not be okay. No, uh, it shouldn't be. It like... Yes. Well, I have another question that's about this subject. Uh, Scott Rosh uh, wants to know, Marianne made it a point uh, that she was keeping her second idol a secret. Is it a good strategy currently to keep any advantages totally secret, especially with new twists like knowledge is power? Is it going to possibly be a shift in strategy going forward to be aware of a player's advantages uh to, that will be kept private in most cases uh can't wait to hear from mary Kay. should players say what hogwarts house is there in in their audition videos um gosh i don't know about the hogwarts house thing like uh that's getting that's getting a little too cute although i think you definitely could sort like have a season of survivor where it's split up into the the four mm-hmm. main archetypes there um and i think I'd have I'd have to spend some time thinking about it. I know people love to sort like survivor players into the houses. Sure. Um, but I think that Just ask it, the real weird sisters. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I have to talk to them if they've ever done a study to see like of all the winners, what the most like popular house is for for that kind of strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's definitely different ways that each of them can win. Uh so for the first part of the question about Marianne, I don't know about you, Rob, but every time I'm ever around like my, my parents or other people I watch the game with, anytime someone finds an idol, they always shout, oh, never tell anyone. Always keep it a secret. This is what I would do. I would never tell anyone I have an idol. Uh, and that seems to be like the plan that first goes through everyone's head. I think the problem is a lot of people get into scenarios like Lindsay, where for whatever reason, they feel like they need to share and provide that information. I think th- the sort of middle ground is ideally you have one ally that you really, really trust in this complicated type of new age survivor where it's really important to like make these complicated vote. I mean, we haven't really seen it as much this season, but in past seasons, like vote splits or weeding out who has advantages, you kind of need to have at least one other person that you can really in depth talk through. Well, if this person has an idol, if this person does this, if they split, if they're working with them and that's a lot easier with one person. So if you, if you have that one person, ideally you tell them about your idol so that you can actually use it together and share information. But uh, yeah, I don't know if, uh, I mean, like, I think the second that we see the, if, if, uh, the knowledge is power gets played this season, I think people are going to start being way more private about what they have mm-hmm. and, and probably way less, you know, like if they do the birdhouse challenge again, right. where they stand in the water and then they say, Hey, swim out to the Stephen Fishback reward or whatever, mm-hmm. and try to grab that advantage. 
people are going to start being way more cautious about getting anything out in the open when they know that someone could immediately turn around and steal it from them. Yeah. So I think that we sort of entered this era officially when the idle nullifier was introduced yes. into the game where it's like, OK, well, I really can't let people know I have an advantage because if they know about it, then they could use the idle nullifier uh, against me. And we saw that really end up uh, with uh, Janet in season 39 getting uh, burned pretty hard on that. Then with the introduction of knowledge is power, uh, it was like twofold where it was like they made a season where it was like all of the advantages had to be like revealed in some way from the secret phrases. But also then there was going to be a thing where you could potentially steal them. And here now we have in this season, you know, knowledge is power is back. Uh, nobody knows it's there. Um, and we could see uh, Mike in particular lose his idol in a, a way where he's going to basically, uh, you know, possibly have it ripped out of his pocket uh, and not even know that that is a thing that's in the game. So I do think that best case scenario is still you don't want to tell anybody about the idol. But then I think that the second best thing is everybody in the game knows that you have an, an idol or an advantage uh, where like Xander, for instance, last season, it was just kind of like a known thing that he had an idol and then it was almost like that people weren't gunning for him either because he had it or they didn't care that he had it because everybody knew. Whereas I feel like that we've seen where if some people know it ends up being a reason why you end up being a target. Yeah. I think the problem with the letting everyone know is it's true that you probably won't get, you might, you might be able to keep your advantage and you might not, you know, might get a target off yourself. I think the problem is the only reason to have an idol is or an advantage is to save yourself or to use it in a way that advances you in the game. And so just having one to hold on to it doesn't really help you. I mean, like it can help you to prevent someone else from having it. Um, but like in you don't want to get into the Xander hole of like you have these idols and advantages, but no one really cares because you're not using them in a meaningful way. And so like if you have an idol, the best case scenario is there's a vote where people are gunning for you and you correctly play your idol and you advance yourself and then you seem really awesome and ideally gained some allies. And so you're no longer a target like that's mm -hmm. like best case scenario. If you just have an idol and you're just kind of chilling with it, like I almost prefer play it and play it wrong, but at least play it because then it shows that you at least tried and tried to do something. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think that if you have it and it's and it's sort of like a gray area where some people know you have it and some people uh, don't, I do think it benefits you to have it. It's just it's it's very hard now in the game where so many of the mechanisms for getting the advantages require other people to have the knowledge, whether it's the shared amulets or the beware advantages or sticking your hand in paint where there's like danger of detection that you're going to get caught. If you are Marianne and you have one of like a like no strings attached idol and nobody else knows about it, I think it's really in her best interest to keep it a secret for as long as possible. Oh, yeah. You keep that under lock and key. Um, the other thing is, if you have an idol like that, uh, you're probably more likely to sort of have people hint at you that they might be voting you out <laughs> and so you can correctly play it like the problem with the having the known idols is that people are going to really really make sure that they either blind you or blindside you or um find another way to to get the idol out there like to to play it against you because with marianne no one thinks she has it anymore um i i do wonder you know we saw Lindsay searching for the idol i'm assuming that probably it was more than just Lindsay and marianne searching for an idol so i wonder at what point do people say uh maybe th maybe they're just not rehiding them this season or if people think okay we haven't found it so someone's clearly got it i kind of mm -hmm. wonder we haven't seen that yet because i don't believe um in season 41 they never had like a, a just re-hidden completely normal idol did they it's unclear that it they looked for it. The players were out there. There was one point where Ricard felt like Danny had found the idol. And I think that right. they even showed like in Danny's boot episode that he was like very close to where the idol was. So I think it was rehidden, but nobody ever found it. Nobody found it. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it, it'll be interesting seeing moving forward because some players might be under the impression that um, 
particularly like Drea, might be under the impression that, hey, all the advantages and idols I found so far have had some sort of string attached. And therefore, if we don't see the string attached with anyone else, then we know that there wasn't a normal idol out there. After this season, if it becomes apparent that like a season might have both types of idols, people are going to be probably a lot more uh, likely to assume that anyone could have an idol at any time. Mary, I have a question for you about the reward challenge. We were talking about Lindsay and revealing the secrets at the sleepover party, but Candace wants to know, what strategy do you use to select the players that go on the reward with you? I thought it was really interesting that um, Lindsay only got to pick two people. Xander got to pick three people for this same exact reward at the same spot in the game last season. Did they feel like that was too big of an advantage for Xander? Possibly. Um, I almost think that it's actually worse. Like the fewer people you get to pick, the more you can say, oh, well, you know, I only got to pick two people, right? But if you're like someone's fourth best ally, you're gonna feel real upset if they're like, oh my gosh, really? I'm not even, I'm not even top three. Like they didn't mm -hmm. even, they didn't even take me. Um, also, it starts to, when you start getting the split being more even of the number of people who don't go on the reward and the number of people who do, it starts getting way more likely that you're going to assume that those people came up with entire vote plans because they had such numbers to deal with. Whereas mm -hmm. when there's only three people gone and there's, how many people were yeah. left? Four, four three five. is better for me. Yeah. It's like, all right, three pick is way one better. more person. But maybe no. like, maybe Lindsay could have lobbied Jeff for another person. I mean, I think at this point in Survivor, we've seen, you can always try. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. probably about a 50-50 shot that she could have gotten it. Mm -hmm. Now, there was something that went down in this picking that I thought was interesting. And this is a whole thread that went all throughout this episode that I just want to cover real quick. Please. Um. Okay, I think you should never publicly shake someone's hand on Survivor. You can do it privately when it's just the two of you. But if I'm out there playing Survivor, I am going to be constantly watching. Fist bump, high five, shake hand, anything that looks like, oh, they just sealed some kind of deal. I'm clocking that. Okay. Mike needs to put his hands away because he, <laughs> he, sh he tried to shake Lindsay's hand when she took him on the reward. She doesn't do it. I don't know why. I think she just didn't see his hand. So this so is at pulls it the away. sanctuary, Mary? No, this is when, when they're standing there at the end of the challenge and she okay. calls Mike up. Uh, she calls Mike up. He's standing there at the at the end of that part. If you go back and watch, he sticks his hand out and she just, I think, doesn't see it and doesn't shake his hand. Mm -hmm. I like to believe that she just refused to shake his hand publicly. Here's why I think this is important. Back in the merge episode, there's a scene where Mike and Jonathan are bonding around like the, I don't know if it's a fire. They're all just sort of sitting on the sand together. And there's like a big circle of everybody. And then slightly outside the circle, but right there next to them, Jonathan and Mike. And Jonathan have that whole conversation about, oh, we're big men, blah, blah, blah. And they straight shake hands. It's very obvious. Big handshake. If I'm sitting in that circle right next to them, I'm going, what was that about? They just shook hands right there. Mm hmm. And what's great about this is later on in this episode, when the idea gets brought up from High and High tells Mike, like, hey, we're going to vote Jonathan out. Mike says, yeah, you know, it'll bother me, but it's fine. I don't have a handshake with Jonathan. And I'm thinking, yes, you do. It might mm -hmm. not be a handshake deal in the same way you had with Roxroy, yeah. but you did shake his hands. But he's lying to High. Either way. Either way, I mm -hmm. just think Mike doesn't remember that he shook his hand. Um, but yeah, so never, that's just an important tidbit for me. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, maybe no one else cares about this, but if you're playing Survivor with me, just know I'm going to be watching all those handshakes. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. The, uh, my, you know, he, she's just given Mike a pizza reward. Like, I feel like um, I'm not going to read too much into that. Okay. <laughs> I think I think that um yeah I mean I think that in this case I'm being silly I think that Mike is the kind of guy who a uh, handshake is just like a thank you thank you very much mm -hmm. like I I get that but I like to believe that this is a world where Mike is thinking at any time I could stick my hand out and later on be like hey we shook hands <laughs> mm -hmm. talk to me about the people that Lindsay selected uh, she picks first is Omer and she talks about how he hasn't had any rewards okay uh, Omer gets to go and then second was Mike. Mm, he had peanut butter and jelly, but, um, you know, that doesn't count. Is there anyone left besides Mike who hasn't had any? I think Romeo words? hasn't had anything. I don't oh. think Romeo was part of the PB and J oh. crew. Poor, poor Romeo. Um, yeah. So I think that 
it seems like just nobody cares about like if you're taking people on this reward, unless you have made some kind of promise deal. Oh, I promise you if there's a pizza reward, I'll take you on it or whatever. Is Although we've seen people win who have gone back on those deals. Mm -hmm. But if you unless you're doing that, I think you always need to take the people that you feel like you need to pull in. And so yeah. I think Mike was a great choice here. Probably. I mean, we didn't see it, but I could easily believe that this is after if this does take place after the Omer conversation with Mike, where he says, you know, I'm sorry that you felt not great about the way that the tribal went down last time. I think that it's possible that Omer could have sort of told Lindsay at some point, like, hey, Mike might be someone we could pull in. We could probably, you know, it'd be good to to have a conversation with Mike at some point away from high. And if those are things that are already uh, living in Lindsay's mind, then I think it's a great idea to pull Mike. I think it gets a little complicated when you're trying to like say it's based on a food thing. Like I'm, I'm kind of surprised we didn't hear from Romeo. Like really you're saying it's mm -hmm. a food thing, but it's not, but I think everyone knows like the reason is always because you want to talk to those people in particular. Mm -hmm. So were those the right people that she ended up picking? So she ends up going with Omer, who is like a trusted ally, who is somebody who that she is working closely with. Uh, and Mike, it's interesting that he was one of the picks because uh, that not somebody that she has really had a lot of interaction with. Right. And that might be why, because like it might be good to talk to him because she knows she hasn't had that interaction with him. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that th I don't think I don't have a whole lot of issues with it. I was trying to think if there was anyone better. I mean, I think it's great that she didn't take Jonathan. If you're already trying mm -hmm. to potentially distance yourself from him, that's fine. Um, I think if you really, really want to, you know, we, we don't know like I, how close her and Drea are. You've mentioned you think they seem kind of like a pair. So if you feel really, really comfortable with Drea, maybe it's okay not to take her. Um, I think it would have been would have been fine to take either Drea or Marianne, but I would not have taken two people from the original mm -hmm. tribe. So she picks one. Yeah. I think that's fine. Um, I think Mike's a good pick. I, I think potentially taking Mike and Drea or Mike and Mary Ann would have also been okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, so it, it I, works I think that, out really well that she has Omer there, but I don't yeah. know, like, I guess the <laughs> she doesn't, but she doesn't know like the reason why it would be great to have him there because he's yeah. going to be trying to steer this. And, and maybe she's hit it off with my, it's just like a friendly uh, thing. I think they're mm -hmm. both from Jersey. Uh, she's, mm -hmm. They've been talking about pizza the whole time. I'm surprised that she didn't end up going with high uh, because uh, should we see her like have that quick conversation with high earlier in the episode about voting out Jonathan, which seems like that that's the plan that she wants to do in this episode. And then she sort of like, ends up getting sort of swept up in Omer throwing high under the bus uh, with um, with with Mike at the reward. So I'm a little surprised, but I just think it was probably just maybe Mike seems like the guy who would might appreciate getting taken on a reward more than high. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there was another direction this could have gone where she could have taken both high and Mike. And, it, and I'm not sure what kind of reasoning she would have to use to do that. I think the problem with taking both high and Mike is it's if you take two people who are both not people you're from your original alliance and tribe, it starts getting very, very transparent that what you're trying to do is like build something else over there. So like, I kind of think like in this scenario, she needed to take one of the people from her original tribe with her as mm -hmm. well. And so she just sort of like, I mean, we we got lucky that we saw some cool strategy there. But I think if she had not taken Omer, she probably would have had the other two people there. The conversation would have been about a plan to get out Jonathan. And we probably would have just either seen the episode go in that direction or Omer would have had to have done a lot back at camp in order to to move things in the anti high direction. Yeah. So could we come up with an equation for this of like, OK, if you get to pick two people, you say like. Who's my closest ally who hasn't eaten? Is that, should that be one of the spots? I, I think that like, it's important to pick the obvious pick. And so if you're out there and you're sort of in like an, an obvious alliance, like it, it's pretty obvious that the, the original ta Taku, I don't remember mm -hmm. their tribe name. Yeah. That they're, they're all working together. So I think it's going to look really transparent if you don't take at least one of those people. So take mm -hmm. one of those people. If you're in a, if you're in a showman's, take that person. If you're in whatever, like pull in one of your, your lock people, preferably if they also haven't eaten or whatever. Um, and then I think the second person needs to be someone that you want to work on someone that you want to pull in or that maybe you 
um, like didn't have a great, you know, interaction with at the previous tribal or whatever, like someone that you think and that you think the person you're bringing who, from your close ally could also sort of help pull to your side. Like, I think that's definitely the formula. It starts getting more tricky when you have to bring more than that number of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the other thing that gets tricky is if you can only take one person, do you take the obvious ally or do you take the person you want to pull? There's almost never a time you only take one person. Yeah, not anymore at least. Yeah, back yeah. in the back in the old days. Um so I think when you're yeah, when you're looking at this, it's like don't don't get too cute and try to make everyone convinced that you're not working with the person you're obviously working with. Like mm-hmm. go ahead and take that person. Um but then yeah, for the for the other person, pull in someone that you're like, "You know what? Haven't talked a whole lot with, you know, whoever. Let's mm-hmm. let's pull them in and see and see where their minds at or especially if you're like now, unless they're going out, there's no reason to bring the person you think you might be voting for, right. which is probably why Romeo is not even on the table because he's going to potentially be a you know backup third, fourth boot, you know, that you're that you're thinking yeah. about for this episode. If, if all else, you know, fails, there's no reason to make Romeo particularly okay. happy. So if you get two people closest ally, especially a closest ally who hasn't gotten reward, who's not going to be like having animosity towards you and then. Who's a fun hang who's going to appreciate going on the reward that you might want to work with? Yes. I, and like, I think Mike works really well, too, because Mike seems like someone who's going to be really appreciative and going to remember that, you know, mm-hmm. and she gets bonus lucky that it is the like family uh, f- fake visit thing because yeah. uh, that you like he's going to remember that even more. And he, he really seemed like I think just like the kind of person who's. Would probably have a hard time wanting to vote Lindsay out that night if she mm-hmm. doesn't win immunity. Yeah, he said, I'm going to remember this till they put me in the ground. He's very dramatic about it. Very dramatic, yes. <laughs> <Okay>. Potential death. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Okay, Brian Patterson wants to know a question uh, that came up uh, during season 41. Do you think it's better to be part of the minority sharing a reward together or the majority sharing in the misery of missing a reward together? Where do you want to be? Xander had talked about that the reason why he set out of the challenge at the final 11 in season 41 was that he felt like that he wanted to be part of the misery. If it's a not combined reward immunity, like if you've only, if you're only winning a reward. Okay. My stance is if it's an individual challenge, don't win it. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's a couple extra circumstances if you really feel like this is the end of the game and you need whatever fuel that reward's going to give you in order to help you win the next couple immunity challenges that's one case or if it's like we haven't really had these recently but like you know back in the old days would be like okay i cannot pass up on the hot air balloon in africa or whatever like it's like yeah go for that but um but nowadays i feel like it's it's okay to be taken on the reward so if you're i mean there's nothing really you can do about that i don't think that you should fight being taken like if you're if you're taken don't say hey no don't take me take this other person because eh, that's just like getting in a tricky thing where now you've sort of embarrassed the person who just took you so don't do that um but i think that if you're not going to be taken on the reward it i do agree with xander i think it is better to be with the losers like i think it's better to be just with the majority of the people at at any given time if Mm -hmm. for some reason a reward where the majority of the people are on the reward hopefully you're on that one (laughs) okay yeah um i I don't know do you think i'm curious from you do you think that it's like is it a really bad look to win reward challenges especially ones where you have to pick people like because i don't i don't think besides like mike here i don't think you're ever going to really win the kind of favor that's going to prevent people from like ever voting you out like that's not never going to happen yeah i think that if you are somebody who's like a jonathan like i think it it sort of like behooves you to win the reward challenges where it's like if you you know it's almost like if you're such a big threat you might as well win all the challenges and so you can sort of like uh like keep fueled up to keep going and win more challenges but as far as like me personally like playing the game like uh, i don't think it necessarily would behoove me so much to be uh like you know trying to rack up the wins in the reward challenges i think i'm probably trying to like okay well we don't have to worry about uh rob because he's not winning the challenges unless you're trying to go for like the survivor record of most challenge wins then like do whatever yeah so i don't think it's like so much that people are like especially when they're sort of like fluky or whatever as long as you know you could win a challenge if it's something that you really want to go for so i don't think for the most part other than the family visit that's the one that does 
kind of blow up in people's faces. And if you're if you know that you're already like on the bottom, I'm like, yeah, win every challenge you can get. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I, I guess it's more like if you know that you're in a pretty good spot and you're pretty athletic to where you think you could win some of the immunity challenges, I would say better to win the immunity challenge than the reward. OK, I, I think that, you know, being around uh, the bigger group of people, um, I think, has some advantages. Um, but I do think that the plan is more likely to come up in the smaller group of people. Like if you are back at camp with five people, I feel like there's almost no chance uh, that you're going to end up like in a plan with those five people. Whereas three people away from the camp are probably more likely to make a plan. Yeah. And, and a lot of this, I, I don't, it's hard for me to think about because I always think, of course, if I was playing Survivor, then I would never be in a situation where I need to like scramble to make people not mm -hmm. want to vote for me. I think the benefit of being in the, um, if you're, if you're someone who thinks that you might be starting to get in a little bit of danger, it, it might help to be in that smaller group to make sure you're in on the plan. Um, but you could also say that, being with the the group of five or whatever it's like now's your time to make sure all those people feel good about you or it you know have have something going so that when the people come back and say hey the plan is to vote you out then you're like oh but we just we just had like such a good day talking and i feel good with them but ideally you don't want to get in that scenario anyway where you're having to fight for your life there come on guys mm -hmm. the, the perfect way to play survivor is just to you know never be on the bottom mm -hmm. yeah just be out in front the whole time yeah okay we have a voicemail uh, for uh, to talk about Shannon High uh, and how they ended up going out in the same spot uh, this season right after the split tribal council. Uh, let's bring in that voicemail from Ben. Okay, here is Ben. This is Ben from Toronto and Atlanta here. Um, watching High's vote out last night, I had a lot of flashbacks in my head to S41, as T-Bird would call it. Yes. Uh, when after Shan flipped on Nasir at the final 10, she then immediately got voted out by almost the entire tribe. Uh, and this season, you see the same thing with High choosing to keep Romeo and flip on Roxroy and then immediately gets voted out after being in a pretty good position in the game. I'm curious um, what lessons future survivors can learn from this mistake that both Shan and Hai have done and maybe how you should act at those split tribal councils in the future if you're in a power position. Um, thanks so much. Would love to hear your thoughts. Um, also looking forward to hopefully a live know-it-alls in either Toronto or Atlanta in the fall. Thanks so much. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben. Interesting, right? That with the yeah. final eight, and you know big moves uh, i know that the high vote out was a big move it's just weird that it like got locked in like 15 minutes into the episode and then uh sort of it didn't end up flipping to anything else but it was like a big player taken out of the game in both seasons the shan one a little bit more uh i guess we could talk about should shan have played her idol at that spot but if you are somebody who is sort of seen as like a controlling player in the game, is there anything else that you should be doing uh, coming out of that split tribal council where now, okay, it's now officially day 19. We're a week from the finale and people are going to be big game hunting. Yeah. So, I, I mean, this, I don't know if this is like the answer people want to hear, but I think the thing you need to do is you don't want to have such a big target on yourself as being known as a big player that early in the game. Like, I think that's the problem with both high and Shan is that they, I don't know if it was due to what they did in their split tribal, but mm -hmm. they were already seen as bigger targets. So when you start getting a couple votes from the end, that's yeah, people are going to target the big targets. So you just need to keep that, that threat hidden for longer. I, I think when you look at, so uh, remind me, was um, Nasir the one voted out at the Shan yes. split? Yes. Tribal? Yeah. So I think with both high and Shan, the thing that's most important in controlling a survivor game, in my opinion, is you just don't want people to get voted out that are not good for you to get voted out. That doesn't mean you always need the best person to get voted out that's best for you that that episode or whatever, that round. But you just don't want to lose someone that doesn't behoove you to lose. So with High, it's interesting because the original plan in that vote, if they had not voted out Roxroy, would be to vote out um, Romeo, Romeo. Yeah. who for High, I think in High's mind, wants Romeo out. So when you start hearing a different plan that says, oh, we got to get Roxroy out because, and the answer is because it's better for Omer to get <laughs> Roxroy out. But, you know, if High really needed to think, is this a time when I really need to 
fight to make this happen. And if he need, if he is feeling like I need to keep Romeo around, like I cannot lose Romeo, then yes, fight to make Roxbury happen. But if you want Romeo out, or if you're okay with Romeo going, then don't don't put anything extra on the line that early in the game to make that happen. Um, and I think it's mm-hmm. complicated because you you know it's all about timing. You never know when when the right time. To, to make this happen is but um i always be cautious and i'm surprised we never really heard high talk about this because it seems like omer just did such a good job of making high think that this was high's plan and what was best for high but yeah you you need to be really cautious of anyone who's trying to pitch you a plan because 10 times out of 10 that's going to be the thing they want and it's better for them and so don't assume it's best for you mm-hmm. so you just always really think about that now when it comes to shan um, I'm trying to remember. Okay, who was all at the Shan Tribal Council? It was Nasir, Shan. Um, Wait, at the, at the split, at the split at the, tribal yeah, council. Yeah, at the split tribal. Yeah, it was okay. It was uh, Shan, Ricard, Nasir, uh, Erica, and Heather. And Erica and Heather. I think at that point, um, I think something we were pretty surprised of was it seemed like Nasir was willing to work with Shan at that point. I think. Yeah, Nasir was yeah. working with Shan and Ricard. Right. So I think that that was definitely not the right move because. Um, you you need to think like we're getting rid of someone that is cool with me and I'm working with that's the time where if you don't have a big target you're trying to get out you need to get out the person who's just the least least person you're working with and I know I think they felt like probably it's split tribal it's so few numbers that now is really the time to 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 make a move or to keep myself safe um and I I know that that can get kind of complicated but for like hi who was not really at any risk of going home in his in Mm -hmm. his tribal um you don't you don't want to try to change the plan to something that's actually not any more beneficial to you, and it can it can be hard to see when you're in the game like that. That's the case. Um, I don't know. You got any yeah. other thoughts on that? Well, I think that for high, I wonder also because we saw in the episode where Rox Roy talks about uh, being in the All Guys Alliance, and High has that confessional where he says, uh, "What is it about me that makes you think that I want to be part of the misogyny club?" And, and I think that for High, I wonder if maybe it was more than just strategy, where he wanted to like from a you know uh, like morally, like he's like, mm-hmm. okay, I I don't want to you know go work with Rox Roy in the game if that's what his idea is. You know, I'd rather you know uh, you know keep Romeo in the game from that standpoint even though I, I really do believe that uh, had Romeo been voted out at that first tribal council, I don't think that High would have been voted out right after that. Yeah, and I mean, of course, that gets into a whole different scenario, too, where the other tribal is probably going to go pretty and differently the other tribal, as well. the other tribal uh, potentially goes uh, differently. Um, maybe Drea ends up uh, getting blindsided, or maybe uh, you know uh, Drea ends up playing her idol, and maybe... Uh, I think that the way that it would have gone is that uh, they were going to put what uh, that Lindsay and Drea were going to put their two votes on Marianne and then uh, or uh, they're going to put their two votes on Tori. Uh, I think it probably would have gone the same way. Uh, if yeah, Drea Tori, plays her idol. yeah, Tori probably still goes there. I think um, it, so it, it probably it probably still works yeah, out that Jonathan, way. Marianne and Tori were going to vote for Drea. If yeah. Drea still plays her idol uh, and gets a little bit like uh, skittish, if she plays her idol in that spot, uh, then Tori would go home. Yeah. And um, I guess we know for sure that that Drea was not going to vote for Mary Ann, like part of the original plan. Uh, was. Dre- I think that Lindsay ended up changing it to a vote okay. split where she ended yeah. up uh, her and Tori were going to uh, vote for um, her her. Lindsay and Dre um, were going to vote for Tori. Right. Yeah. So that one probably goes similarly. You know, it, it's complicated because I don't know, like, if if Romeo goes out, um, then I don't think that I, – I don't know if the guys start so, – you know, you, you got Jonathan, Roxroy, and Mike back together – uh, for the next tribal, I don't know if they, mm-hmm. they 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 probably do want to stay pretty solid. So you know, hi if if Omer's like oh, I got to take someone else out. But then again, if you got those three guys, Omer might think, well, I can't lose high because I need to get rid of some yeah. of the other the, the other big guys. So it, that 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 is where you might start seeing if the you know if the second tribal go well again, but the conversation might not be there. But the but the issues with between Lindsay and Jonathan 
about what happened are still previously there. back at camp. We're still there. Right. So I think you you likely see Jonathan being targeted here yeah. um, again, and maybe that goes that goes better. Um, I think it's hard, though, because everything I just said for high about you shouldn't have voted uh, Roxroy out if that wasn't like the beneficial thing to you. That's the same thought process that Omer was having. Omer was thinking, I don't want to get Romeo out. That doesn't behoove me. Mm-hmm. Time to get one of the bigger guys out. And so I think it's going to be hard of just like, how do you say no to Omer in that scenario, especially when he's so good about trying to convince you that it's good for you? Mm-hmm. So, um, but it seems like Omer really needed both. Well, he really needed one of High or Mike to get on board. And I don't think he's getting Mike without High. And so really, it did come down to High there. Yeah. Uh, and I think if so. High ends up, okay, look, Romeo wrote my name down. Yeah, I'm not going to I'm not gonna keep him around. That He's been trying yeah. to, you know, uh, stir the pot against me. He's lying to me. I know he voted for me. Got to vote out Romeo. I think that we could see a scenario where then Omer and High still are working together. Um, and high still has Mike feeling good. And now high has more options of, okay, I could keep working with Mike and, uh, Roxroy and Jonathan, or I could go to Drea and Lindsay and potentially Marianne and then work with the, uh, the three women with Omer and potentially, you know, break up the guys that want to work together. Yeah. And he had, we really, I think, didn't talk enough last week about how amazing it was that Omer somehow convinced Ty to make this move that really wasn't good for him, ended up making everything worse because, um, it, yeah, it's like that, like, he had perfect reasoning for why he wanted Romeo to go. And it would take a lot from someone to say, no, it's not good for you to vote out the person who just voted for you and is against you. And so like he had perfect reasoning lined up to want to vote Romeo out. And then you move into the sort of Romeo spot of being the only other guy left who Omer feels like maybe isn't the biggest, you know, uh, challenge threat in the end for him to work with compared to all the other guys around. So I think that like, that's actually the better spot to be in. Uh, Oh, well, it's sad that it happened that way. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, and I, and I know that it's complicated when you bring in the moral thing of like wanting to break up the the guys alliance, especially because you're right there with that opportunity. But I think it's sort of more beneficial for Hyde to be like, yeah, Omer, you and me know that we don't want to be part of the guys alliance. So let's let's keep that being a thing and then we'll strike when the time is right. But right now is mm-hmm. not the time. Yeah. OK. Nathan Fuhrer, who I got to see in New York this week, wants to know at what point in the game is it important to make visible big moves so that the jury knows whose fingerprints are on the game? We've seen plenty of great sneaky moves by Omar, uh, but will he be able to compel the jury to vote for him if he remains under the radar for much longer? Or can a great orator uh, convince any jury, regardless of how stealthy uh, their moves were throughout the game? This is very interesting because Omar has played this really great game where on television, and I feel that this comes up maybe more on Big Brother, where there's uh, somebody who like has played the better game that we've gotten to see, but the jury uh, who has been you know uh, sequestered and doesn't really get to see it as much, uh, is it possible that the jury could not recognize how great of a game Omar has played? I think it's possible. I think the reason it happens more on Big Brother also is just the format of the finale. Like they don't mm. get as long to speak to their game. Right. But um, I, I know the format of the finale has changed. But do you know enough about like exactly how much time do they have to kind of fight for themselves in Survivor? Like, will Jeff just kind of let you keep going and talk? If yeah, if especially like in the open more? Tribal Council format. Yeah, I think it's like whereas like it was much more in the beginning where. It's like, okay, uh, you know, opening statement, everybody has to get the question. But now, um, you know, it's it's an open format. However, that if the jury has sort of like pre-decided, okay, tonight it's between Jonathan and Marianne for us. Uh, and then they, they don't like go to Omer with questions, then there's not a ton that he can do. Yeah, like I think that's the complicated. the Troy or the Ryan Ulrich or the Nora, like uh, sometimes the jury just comes in like, eh, you're not really in the conversation tonight. Yeah, I, I think if, you, if you're if you at a final tribal where you're in this new format and you see that you're not getting a lot of questions thrown to you, but you feel like you've actually played a really great game, I don't think Jeff is going to be mad if you just start interjecting and start mm-hmm. like, hey, I need to talk to my own game. I need to fight myself here, if, even if no one's going to ask me a question. Um, I think it's going to be hard if they're, if they're already you know, you got to change minds that are not even considering you as a winner. That's pretty difficult. I don't see Omer in that 
spot necessarily because that's more likely when everyone is walking around going, oh, Omer's doing nothing. He's not even a factor. But I don't think people consider him that way. I think people consider him to be a, you know, decent a decent ally and 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 mm-hmm. a social butterfly and so i feel like yeah. if you're if you're in that spot like you're yeah, they like him and so they're they're probably not going to completely rule him out he's not objectionable um i think that you can win just by having the good argument in the end i think that you need to start at least hinting to some things being your own idea and i'm not I'm not sure how exactly to do that in this in this format. Um, I don't know. My my experience with online survivor was always you just get to a point where it starts becoming really obvious that you're part of the group that's that's running the game, and then you just sort of cling on and hope that you can keep it up. You know, win the final a couple challenges. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's I, I think it's better to become a big threat than to make it all the way to the end with that can still being hidden. Yeah, like you know, I, I'd feel like I'd, I'd sort of rather get voted out in fourth place with everyone knowing that you were a huge threat to win the game, than make it all the way to the end and get no votes because no one ever saw it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably the better scenario there. So I think at some point, you know, may, maybe Omar just starts just starts telling people, "Hey, you know that you know that high vote? I actually totally came up with that or something." I mean, maybe just try that. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because I think you uh, he has all the receipts, so it's not like that he's like delusional where he thinks no. that he. Uh, did these things uh, when he actually didn't. I also think that if you drop too many bombs on people at the final tribal council, I think people might like react like negatively to finding something out. Like for instance, um, if Mike ends up uh, d- a discover, if Mike ends up on the jury and discovering about how he got kind of played by Omer, do you want to like let that information out a couple of tribal councils beforehand? So it has the chance to like, okay, explode and then settle and then like uh turn mike around and say you know you may not have agreed with the way i played the game but i played you know i played hard and i did i made all these moves and i had to get you out and so i think that omer definitely can do that in the final tribal council Uh, i do think that you're right i think you need to start to you know i think you can like uh deliver that message like slowly across a couple of tribal councils i think the trick will be how do you do it without having everybody feel like, well, we can't let this person get to the end now. Yeah. And and it's hard. And something that people do in big brother to sort of combat this is that they confide in one person that they hope gets sent to the jury. What's been going on, hoping that they'll sort of spread the information for you. Um, That's, that's tricky also uh, because they could, you know, that can blow up if they, if they don't appreciate the way that they were sent to the jury as well Mm -hmm. um so it's definitely tricky but i think you'll see that a lot of the the players who do win who sort of were playing behind the scenes for a while will start to to feed some of those ideas at the final tribals or at the at the ones leading up to the the finale um and and that's a great way to you know suss out what like what the jury might be thinking of you. And you can kind of also do it in the other way. Whereas if you, if you start getting a vibe that maybe the jury has some negative thoughts about you start bringing those things up at the, the tribals leading up to the end and sort of combat them there. Um, and I think like Sophie Clark has always talked about as someone who did that pretty well. Mm-hmm. Mary, um, one more question for you. Elizabeth mm-hmm. Barry wants to know, uh, how is the Jeff cardboard cutout? Jeff cardboard cutout is doing great. Um, mm-hmm. He's he's under my bed because that's where we keep him <laughs> because otherwise he's too scary. Uh, if you you know you don't think about it when you you see him standing there, but it's when you uh, you know are, are walking out of the bathroom late at night and uh, in the corner it looks like a real person. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, he's hanging out there um, doing much better than my sister's Liam Hemsworth cardboard cutout, which her boyfriend put an axe in the back of. So oh my god, a, a fake axe. It was a fake axe. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, don't. He doesn't like him standing around either. Um, yeah, he's doing great. So, anything else from earlier in the season that uh, really stood out to you as something that you would uh, take away from uh, being a prospective uh, future player? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I, a lot of it's been so talked through. Obviously, like the most, I think, the moment that a lot of the the strategy nerds were thinking about was the the tribal council where. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, Jenny end up going home, of course. Yes. yes. Um, but uh, beyond that, I think a lot of it is just like really being able to like read the room of 
how people are perceiving you. And this can come up with Tori. It can come up with Marianne um, in very different ways. But if, you know, I think it's all for like being yourself and showing your personality and then knowing when to knowing when to, to tone it down or to change it. And uh, that's something I've been learning about myself only in the last short period of time mm -hmm. is if, if I visit someone who I don't see all the time, I feel like I need to nonstop just talk because I'm like, oh, I never get to see you. So now it's time to talk, 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 talk. And only recently has someone pointed out like, wow, you just do not stop, do you? And I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. you know, never... Uh, Never. I'm like, I knew I talked a lot, but that's why that's why we have okay. a podcast outlet to get rid of that podcast outlet. So, all right. So if you go visit somebody now, you tone it down. Yeah. I like actively try to tone it down a little bit so that I'm I'm not just bombarding. I don't like this. With my I don't like this, Mary. Don't tone it down. <laughs> don't let people tell you to tone it down. Uh, yeah. But on Survivor, I think that's important. Do too. we tell Mary Ann to no. tone it down? Well, and then there's also obviously the difference of like, if you want to be loved by the audience, definitely yeah. don't tone it down mm -hmm. because <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna love that especially. But uh, yeah, I think I think it's hard when it, like you, a lot of times Jonathan also like will will get frustrated with someone. You can't get frustrated with anyone for being mm -hmm. themselves. All you can do is use that as a reason to potentially vote them out. Mary, do you see a path uh, to the end or to win for Marianne, who's been so fun to watch on this season? But as I've like uh, sort of like I'm wrapping up the week of like talking about the episode, obviously she got the idol again uh, this week. But I think if I was going to rank the final seven in terms of like uh, who has the best shot to win, I think I'd have her pretty close to the bottom, uh, even though. I don't think she's like an obvious target uh, and she also has an idol, but for whatever reason, I just don't see her uh, as somebody who is going to uh, come up in the final. I mean, I, I would say probably in the, in my thought exercise, I think Romeo has the worst shot to win. And then I think I probably would have uh, Marianne, maybe, you know, the highest at four. Um, I guess I, I, I just off the top of my head, I think my my rankings for winning uh, win equity right now, I'll say uh, I'll go Omer, Drea, Lindsay. Um, I think it's tough for Mike to get there. Um, so I would say. I guess I'll be. Uh, I'll, I'll be charitable. Say I'll say uh, even Marianne at four, then Mike, then Jonathan, then then Romeo. That uh, that was pretty close to where I had it. Um, I honestly completely forgot about Mike, and so he wasn't even <laughs> on my list mm -hmm. initially. But yeah, I think I think that's close. I think I could actually see a scenario where Marianne beats Lindsay as well. Um, I think if you have like Marianne and Lindsay and um, Romeo or Jonathan or any or Mike or any of the people who are below Marianne on that list, if you have them there, I think that Marianne's potential likability and for whatever it's, it really depends on how Lindsay gets to the end. If Lindsay like turns against Omer in some kind of way, I think that she's going to get more something about Marianne's personalities. I feel like she's not going to get as much hate for potentially turning on people. Weirdly, like mm -hmm. I think seen as probably the person who isn't leading the vote and therefore you're probably more mad at the person who's leading the vote now you might also be more like f feeling like they did a move to you know mm -hmm. take you out and I, I think a lot of players on this game like when we saw with high i don't think they're going to be super upset with someone playing you know taking them out if they see them as a threat um with with maybe the exception of mike i think mike might might be upset yeah. no matter how he goes out um so it, it it's close i i don't know I, I think it really depends on what marianne does if marianne can save herself when she's going to go home by playing the idol i think that's huge for her game um and i think that she based on everything we've seen especially in the previous episodes tribal council a very very good uh with her mm -hmm. words and uh i think she definitely has a shot um i don't even know if i would have drea quite as high as you have her um I, I think that she's doing well and has a lot of um valuable items obviously but i'm I'm just not sure we've seen it like i think she's also made a lot of moves that weren't necessarily great for her um 
like position in the game, yeah. like her joining the big alliance. Um, obviously, it wasn't her move, but losing Rock Roy was not great. And then sort of actively choosing to lose Romeo. I don't think any of those things are really, really great. So I'm not sure if anyone yet sees Drea as being like, uh, like I think when they talk about her threat level, they pretty much only talk about the things that she has. Yeah, I think that Marianne could just be, you know, not in anybody's end game plans. Like I see her, like she's not in anybody's final three that we know of at this point right now. So it's hard for me to imagine her ultimately getting there. I could see her being the person who loses fire making. I think that's possible. Yeah, I, I sorry, I was thinking more about like how she could beat people in the jury, but in terms of actually getting there, and, I think well, I think both, that is hard. both. Because yeah. I think I, I think that she's actually like super high variance in the final tribal council. I could mm -hmm. see her. Um, just completely just like going off on tangents and like being like a total mess at the final travel council. I could also see her giving one of the best final travel councils of all time. Like she's right. been very hit or miss at tribal councils uh, where sometimes like I could see her like really getting a lot of momentum and making like this incredible, like uh, emotional uh, plea of why she should win the game that everybody's like, yes, yes, Marianne. Uh, and then I could also see her just like, you know, going off into like the uh, bunny in the, mailbox territory exactly exactly so if, i think that really depends on how much she sort of preps and locks it in um but yeah the getting there is a little tricky i think that that's also if you if some if they're in a scenario where at the final four or five you have like if if somehow if somehow romeo and jonathan have already gone or at least one of the two of them. You could get in a scenario where Lindsay or Omer or Drea start like fighting for wanting someone they think they could beat in the end. Mm -hmm. And that might be how Marianne gets to the end is but that they just need to to get rid of the other people. Um, okay. Yeah, it's tricky. It's definitely tricky. Mary, anything else you want to say about Survivor? Yeah, I have w one more point I wanted to make, which was just that um, I really, really liked the scene. I really identified with Omer and the scene where he says, you know, everyone is now against Ty maybe I should just flip it back. And maybe that is probably more just a confessional thought than anything he really considered. But that is something that I think comes up a lot in Survivor and particularly the online reality games of this idea of going from like enemies to lovers. Like we love that. Um, and so we're like, you always think like, well, maybe, maybe I should just, you know, do the, do the thing that now, now if it was easy enough to get everyone to do this thing, maybe it's no longer beneficial for me to, to go along with that. Mm -hmm. And I think when you start having those thoughts, you need to do what Omar did and say, no, nope, nope, back away. This is where, this is where it all goes, goes wrong. Right. It's almost never actually beneficial for you to work with someone that you have originally had a reason to not work with. If you had a yeah. reason to not work with them, don't don't second guess yourself. Seems obvious. So but it, it does it does play yeah. with your mind because it seems fun. I really wonder how much uh, Omer was really thinking that and how much was he sort of like just doing a solid for the producers of I like, uh, just, yeah, you know, uh, like, well, what if like, uh, could you just say like, uh, maybe you'll go a different array? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because otherwise, what else are they what else are they going to do in terms of the the backup mm -hmm. edit plan? Yeah, because there was uh, not a lot of evidence to support that Jonathan was going to be going out of that tribal council. No, of course not. But mm -hmm. um, but it was still fun. So I appreciated that that he threw mm -hmm. that in there. Yeah. Yeah. Just something to think of. Now, I think if you're on Big Brother, completely different story. You should always just <laughs> double back. <laughs> double. Yeah, sure. Like, I don't know. Do whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> With Big we, Brother, we, you've got so much time. We love a last minute vote flip on Big Brother. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You got so much time to work on those people for the next week that you <laughs> that you just changed on. So yes. I think it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mary, well, great job here with me in the Survivor Academy. Where can people uh, hear more of your amazing podcasting? Well, you can uh, check out everything I'm doing over on Kowski Cast. That's cow with a K. Um, covering uh, Riverdale season six right now with Kirsten mm -hmm. McInnes. And we've had a couple really fun uh, podcasts. I'll say, I don't know about episodes, but we've had some really fun podcasting going on over there, having to get very creative with our schedules. Um, so if you're interested in like, extremely off the walls editing of two people who could not necessarily record at the same time, got a lot of that over there for you mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah okay um, yeah. So otherwise you can just follow me at frail mary to see where else i'm going all right frail mary so nice to have you back here uh this was a lot of fun to go through uh if you are looking for some more uh looking into the future i had a great podcast on the survivor feedback show with dave jorgensen uh the washington mm -hmm. post tiktok guy we really talked through everything with the do or die who is the most uh, likely people to uh, be participating in the do or die and who is most likely to get 
do or die uh, in the upcoming episode. So if you're interested in all that, check out our Survivor Feedback Show. And of course, if you liked, if you like what we had to say about playing Survivor, check out this podcast every week in our patron feed at robinsonwebsite.com slash patron. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.